Welcome everyone to Beauty and the Surgeon podcast. I'm Amy. I'm a nutritional therapy practitioner, and I'm joined today, as always, by my very esteemed co-host. I'm very esteemed. Dr. Jason Martin. He's a board certified plastic and reconstructive surgeon. Dr. Martin, how you doing? Good. Episode 150, Amy. I'm 150 episodes. I'm sad to say I don't have a crown for this milestone. I know, I know. For episode 200. Brush my shoulders off. Yep. 150. Let's do some streamers. Let's get some Dirt editing in this joint. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Episode 150, it is summer in Colorado. If you hear thunder, it's because there might be or rain. We're having some inclement weather when yeah. we're filming this. So please leave us a voicemail if you hear the thunder. 303-630. That thunder could just be our great comets that are coming through your airwaves and your mm -hmm. earbuds. Yes. Well, we have four. And I didn't even realize that it would work out this way, that for our 150th episode, we would have a cool thing to open on air. Yeah. Yes. What is that exactly? So I, we got this. I'm going to cover up. She has a black address, bag. Not that it's not on yeah. The line. Yeah. Um, this is from Element, who we love. So oh, we love Element sent us something, and I was going to open it, and then I realized we were recording soon, so I decided I would open it on air. So I'm going to make a lot of noise here, Nils. So anyone listening, Amy's opening up a package from an esteemed company oh, named Element. Oh, cool. Oh, nice. Oh, Look. Flag, eh? Yep. We got a sticker. <laughs> Salt and Soul. Salt and Soul. We want a free gift. Thank you for being one of our saltiest customers. Perfect. They sent us a water bottle. Nice. Ooh, it's very green. So, Amy, why don't you tell everyone about Element? We'll give them for free. Yeah. Free so, press Element, here. we have we talked about this on one of our uh, stuff we're into episodes at some point in time. Uh, Element is an electrolyte beverage. It has the perfect balance of magnesium, potassium, sodium. Prevents uh, cramps. Also great for people who uh, do intermittent fasting because it keeps your electrolytes up, so you don't get headaches. I, I drink it every time yeah. before I lift weights. It's the best. It's the and best. Uh, anytime Dr. Martin comes in, is complaining that he feels a little off. I'm like, did you drink your Element today? Yeah, and I didn't. I didn't. Yeah. So we love Element. We are huge fans, and thank you so much, Element, for sending us this cool. And the, cool and they have some pretty good flavors, and also uh, it quells my salt. Addiction. Right. Oh, they are delicious. They actually, um, in the winter months, which now it is the middle of summer, but in the winter they do a chocolate variety pack that yeah. you can drink warm. Oh, super good. That something about even putting them in your coffee. And I know salty coffee sounds probably gross to some people, but it is delicious. So, yes. I All would right. not judge your culinary like hot fluid desires because you had a, <laughs> that turmeric was terrible. The the cod liver oil. Everything you've given us is disgusting. Pretty yeah. much. Sad. <laughs> but element is not that way. No, so. element's delicious. And I've yeah. given you guys both elements. So there you go. I've right, given good. you good stuff. So All right, what's our topic today? We in have the 150th an awesome episode. topic today. This is actually the New Beauty Magazine Guide to Choosing Your Surgeon. This was from the spring 2023 episode or issue. I'm going to show it. There's a picture. But there it is. This was 2023. The um, best of is kind of their top awards for the year. New Beauty Magazine has been around for a really long time. They have a great website too, but they they talk about things all in the like aesthetic world. Uh, plastic surgery fits into that world. So it just so happened that I was at the very, very end. This was like literally one of the back pages in the, in the issue. And I came across this. Where's the beginning? This is the beginning. I'm like, no, before you go. And I read this. So what is New Beauty? New beauty. What is the what exactly is the magazine? That's is it is more of an industry? Did you just say that? I just said that. Okay. Yeah. It's, no, it's market. It's to patients. Okay. It's to patients. That's what I'm asking. Or is it yeah. B2B? It's not business no, to business. It okay. is not. This is this is you buy this on the shelf, get this before you hop on a plane. Like okay. I think most people you know. You can get it in an airport, is. like a regular Correct. person. Okay. Yep. This is goes to people. And that's why I found this so fascinating. Because like I said, I was at the very, very back and I saw this little thing. This is no before you go. And it said this. Not every doctor is equipped to perform every single aesthetic treatment, nor should they. Therefore, choosing the right doctor can be overwhelming. Use this handy guide to help figure out which board certified specialist to see for your chosen procedure. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I am not the only one shouting from the rooftops yeah. on every episode. God, if we have to hear that one more time for you, thank God a national publication is saying right? it too. So I read it. I'm like, well, this is amazing. So we're going to go through this. It's very short. I, I did cut the pages out just so I wasn't having to deal with a lot of noise from the actual magazine. So it was just a few pages, such great stuff. So we're kind of going to, we're going to go through what is out there in like pop culture world, right? This is marketed toward patients, prospective patients who are considering one of these aesthetic procedures. Um, and it's really awesome. So they have great advice, advice that we have talked about before, but it just gave it, I felt like a little more, made me feel justified that I am not the only person saying these things. So a little pat on the back. Yes. So let's jump in. So New Beauty Magazine says there's three steps. 
Step number one. You got to buy the magazine. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So shout out to New Beauty. Shout out to, we're just giving shout outs right. to everyone that aren't our sponsors. So that's fine. Read New Beauty. New one Beauty of my magazine. favorite magazines, by the way. Read New I've, Beauty magazine. I've heard about it and I read it all the time. Step number one. Okay. Step number two. Pay attention to boards and societies. Ooh. Now, this is something I do do, New Beauty. Mm -hmm. Giving you some props there. Number three, Dr. Martin, this one goes to you too. You say that. Avoid cosmetic surgeons. And that's in Yeah, and they specifically quotes. say, most doctors who refer to themselves as cosmetic surgeons rather than plastic surgeons do not hold recognized board certifications and may have limited or no plastic surgery training. A major red flag, a major red flag, let me say that again for people in the back, is if the doctor belongs to the American Board of Cosmetic Surgery or any board with the word cosmetic in it. Hmm. Okay, I'm not the only one who says these things. <laughs> right, because uh, I'm sure we'll go through the different subspecialties. We will. But their boards all have the name of that subspecialty in it. For example, the American Soci uh, the American Board of Plastic Surgery, which I am board certified by, has plastic surgery in the name. Yeah, okay. and going back to number two, paying attention to boards and specialties, board certified doctors who practice within scope and are qualified to perform aesthetic procedures belong to any number of approved societies, are verified by the American Board of Medical Specialties, and have undergone the necessary training right. and demonstrated best practices for patient safety. Cosmetic dentists and hair restoration specialists do not receive board certifications, but still belong to certain elite medical societies. Yeah. So we're actually going to break down every single one of these types That's of That's interesting. So there's a board board certification society governing thing that is over the American, the the, the, mm -hmm. board, the board of plastic surgery. Correct. So, so there, yep. there's something that they have to, there's some um, mechanism or litmus that they, as the board of for plastic surgeons has to fit, that fits with what was dictated by this organization. Correct. So I it's not like that. they're just making up their own. I Whereas didn't know that. Other boards, like maybe perhaps the cosmetic surgery board, yeah. has made up their own. <laughs> and they, Interesting. Yeah. So we're going to break down each type of doctor who performs like what we're going to call aesthetic procedures and talk about kind of, you know, the things that you need to know about them. Board certified doctors are recognized as the core four aesthetic specialties featured in New Beauty are plastic surgeons, facial that's, plastic that's surgeons. That's me, by the way. Board certified plastic ring surgeon, yeah. facial plastic surgeons, which is ENT, ear, nose, and throat surgeons, oculoplastic which surgeons, which is ophthalmologists that do extra training and dermatologists. Everyone knows what that is. Go ahead. As well as other aesthetic experts like cosmetic dentists and hair restoration specialists who possess the appropriate qualifications, advanced training, and expertise. I'm going to make one caveat before we get into this further. So, New Beauty Magazine does have a listing of providers in the back. These doctors pay. However, they are actually qualified. So it's not like other magazines, like one in Denver is 5280. You literally can pay to be in it. They don't care what kind of doctor you are. You can call yourself whatever you want. They'll be like, great, you're the best plastic surgeon in Denver. So says 5280 Magazine. You've no board certification, right? New Beauty's not like that. So they do have doctors that are listed at the very back, right? Like, with their fancy pictures? With their pictures, with little bios about oh, them. They look very fancy yep. and nice. And these people... Absolutely, all these wonderful doctors are paying to be in here. However, they are all also qualified. And yeah. I do appreciate that about New Beauty. Yeah. So everybody's gotta get paid, right? Everyone wants to make money. But just know that the doctors in there, we're not endorsing any of them. They do pay to get in, but they do all possess the necessary qualifications. I would add one here, or oral maxillofacial surgeons, since they're MD and um, D DMD trained. Uh, and I think some of them do really good kind of cosmetic procedures. They're very talented and educated, and they have a rigorous board. But that yeah, this doesn't include every board no, specialty. I understand, yeah. but like, uh, but these four are the primary four that you would get things done with, specifically yeah. for aesthetic things. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's these are the ones that they're going to break down. All right. So let's first talk about plastic surgeons. These who they, are the people in who your they be? Who are those plastic surgeons? Yes. So board surgeons or plastic surgeons, who are they? Head to toe specialists performing surgical procedures and non-surgical procedures for the face and body. And that's kind of key when we start talking about facial plastic and oculoplastic. You know, they might work from the neck up. Plastic surgeons, when people say, like, what does your doctor do? I'm like, head to toe. Like we do everything. In right. fact, we have a really old podcast episode that probably doesn't even have a video that's head to toe surgery. It's audio mm -hmm. It's a really, I mean, maybe episode in the early teens, maybe early 20s. You should listen to it because it's probably hilariously bad. But it's really, when we talk about like what We've can be done We've gotten a lot the better face, in 150 yeah. episodes. We kind of go through the body and talk about it because plastic surgeons can do surgery head to toe. Some specialize in one area, but in theory, plastic surgeons are head to toe. 
top to bottom, face and body. And that's true for aesthetics and reconstructive surgery. So they're very highly trained. Plastic surgery training is is. Oh, well, we're going to talk about education. Okay. Let's it's, let's jump. Let's do that in a second. So what okay. they do is almost any aesthetic procedure and have extensive training in education. Right. So talk about the education, Dr. Martin. Uh, education for plastic surgeons is one of the longest of all sub surgical specialties. The only ones longer are about the same or neurosurgery, which is amazing because those people yeah. work on the brain and maybe and cardiovascular <laughs> surgery. Uh, definitely more, no matter what they say, than the facial plastic surgeons. Definitely more than the dermatologists. Um, Definitely more than oculoplastic surgeons. Now we're talking about a year or two difference, but you know it's something that's sizable. So the education, the training is pretty long and rigorous. There's two ways to go into plastic surgery. You can match right in from medical school, or you can do general surgery first and then do plastic surgery afterwards. The direct match is what's more common now. I came up at a time when most people went through general surgery first. And so you'll see a lot of plastic surgeons are double board certified in both general surgery and plastic surgery too. Yeah. Which is good because uh, general surgery has applicability in all aspects of, of surgery. I think one of the main things that I think was so special about your training in, in general surgery is that you see a lot more than what we see. Like, we, you know, we do, you're an adjunct professor now, so we see residents coming through the plastics right. program, some of whom have general surgery training, some of whom do not. And the difference in kind of like their outlook on medicine is pretty drastic. Yeah, and their competence level. It doesn't yeah. mean that in the end they can't all be the same or good. Right, same plastic surgery level, yeah. but I just mean like general overall and understanding of medicine and sickness and everything else. Yeah. yeah, just a little different. So in New Beauty, it does say that you know, of course, medical school, and then a two or five year surgical residency in general surgery, and an additional two to three years of plastic surgery training uh, residency or six years of plastic surgery training residency. So like Dr. Mar was saying, like there is a the direct course. I did more because I'm yep. an idiot. So As well as on <laughs> I was trying to go for the record. <laughs> yeah. Oh, somebody, though there's that, that's the person who just keeps their yeah. uh, student loans in deferment until the day they years. die. Yeah. yeah. As well as ongoing continuing education during their career, which is true. We have to maintain a certain amount of continuing education credits throughout the life of you as a surgeon. I mean, think about that real quick. I went through undergrad, which was four years. Okay. And then I did four years of medical school and seven years of training. It's really highly specialized training. Yeah. Yes. What was I thinking? Right. right? And then your OBGYN is going to call themselves a plastic surgeon. Yeah. Right. Now, I, you can't compare apples to apples. Someone who's calling themselves a plastic surgeon and didn't go through plastic surgery training, obviously, any logical, reasonable person is not going to you know, think they're a plastic surgeon. But mm, people believe whatever there they is, see on the side. There is a currency that occurs after your seventh or eighth year of trading. Mm -hmm. I mean, at some point, you're like super specialized. You really know a lot. And uh, I can tell you, when I got into practice, I got shot out of a cannon. I felt very comfortable. I felt very confident. And I, I just, you know, really became successful. I mean, it took a while, but fairly quickly. And so it really did me well, but that's a huge sacrifice in life. It's a lot of training. Um, I don't think training equates to talent. Or competency. Or competency, but... Yeah. I don't know if I'm in a plane and the, the pilot, I know, tr you know what I'm saying? I yeah. mean, seriously. Maybe not just the bare minimum. Right. I'll, 10, I'll take the, the more trained person yeah. first and then we can deduce out if they're good or not. So, exactly. And something else that the board requires is that you actually re up your certification every 10 years. So, you actually had to do that in 2018. And I had to take a test. Yep. And you'll have to do it again in 2028. And like I that is killed it. Required. I passed. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's big. So, the American board, board, the board and societies for Board certified plastic surgeons are the Aesthetic Society and or the American Society of Plastic Surgeons. There are two. We keep and we do a whole episode on why board certification matters. So if you want more in depth about just plastic surgery, be sure to watch that episode. They can also be members of the American Board of Plastic Surgery, American Osteopathic Board of Surgery, which we have one of the residents is going to do that. He's going to do osteopathic. Yeah, DO. Yep. And primary certification in plastic surgery and the Royal College of Surgeons and Surgeons of Canada. Oh, by the way. There's amazing, amazing plastic Canada. surgeons in other countries. Yeah. England, amazing. Uh, Canada, amazing. South America, I mean, different countries. Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, amazing. South Korea, uh, I mean. Yeah, if you are having surgery with a surgeon in another country, though, maybe look into some of these things. No, I understand. But like there are some really good yeah. um, national societies in some of these countries uh, that are rigorous and, you know, plastic surgery is, uh, is a field that's been around a long time. Um, it didn't really become in vogue until the, you know, 1900s, but it's an amazing field that's rich in training and everything else like that. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Let's move on to facial plastic surgeons. Yeah. So who they are, these are face focused surgeons perform surgical and non-surgical procedures of the face and neck. So these are the ones, like I said, these are neck up. 
Uh, if you have, if you need a tummy tuck, they're going to refer you to us. <laughs> if you or need they're going to try to do it themselves. Let's that's let's fine. hope. Well, yeah. this is in best. This is what they actually best practices. Yes, yeah, gotcha. best practices. Yeah. What they do. <laughs> plastic surgeons or facial plastic surgeons have a complete understanding of the face, both externally and internally. For functional problems like a deviated septum, you may want to see one of these surgeons. The education they receive is medical school, yet again, followed by one year of general surgery training and four years of otolaryngology. So that's five years. Head and neck yep. surgery training. That's ENT. So if you, yep. they they use fancy words because it's always a street battle. Everybody's trying to market themselves. Saying. So it's like ear, nose, and throat doctors that are focused on the facial component of plastic surgery or aesthetics. Yep. Many facial plastic surgeons also complete an additional year of plastic so surgery training. So one more year. Yeah. Yep. So that's uh, six, six years. So they train a lot. So they do one year supposedly of general surgery and then four more years of ENT. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yep. So that's five years total. And then I think now it's very common. They'll do another year in facial plastic surgery. Just FYI, I did plastic surgery and then I did another year in, in uh, aesthetic plastic surgery in New York City. So an extra year. And I think that's really good. Actually, I think if you're looking for a facial plastic surgeon, you really want them who does aesthetics, you want them to have that extra year of yeah. training. If they're of reasonable age. If they're older, I don't think those training programs existed in the early 90s. So if they're, they've been around a long time and that's just what they do, then you know they probably didn't even have an opportunity to train in some of those things. Yeah, some of them. Uh, the societies and boards for this type of provider are going to be the American Board of Otolaryngology, American Board of Facial Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, American Osteopathic Boards of Ophthalmology and Otolaryngology. I can't believe I've had to say this word so many times. Head and neck surgery with primary certification in otolaryngology, the Royal College of, Surg of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada, and the American Academy of Facial and Facial Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. Seriously, yeah. the word otolaryngology. I mean, like, I can't even believe I think it. you say it really well. I mean, for for someone that is uh, really struggles with yeah. the word pronunciation, I mean, you're killing it. It's the one, I'm like, I seriously, it's like, it, it, you see it and you're like, oh, that's not a real word. Yeah, like, yeah I so, don't even say it. No, I refuse. <laughs> just say, yeah, it's ENT. So they also, like Dr. Martin uh, said, they go through pretty equal training, but yeah. they're keeping it all above the, above the collarbones, yeah. let's say. Do really cool stuff with reconstruction too. I mean, these are really great doctors. Yeah, really, really awesome surgeons. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I get along with ENTs really well. Uh, we work together mm -hmm. on different cases. I'll do combo cases. Uh, you know, you're going to have the typical stuff where they're going to tell you, "Well, I'm an expert in the face, and the yeah. plastic surgeon is the expert in the body." It's they do like, body. It's always so it's, funny. They say it so disparagingly, like, "Oh, well, that's of the body." That's of the body. Like the body doesn't matter. The right. face is in the head, neck, but. In reality, just FYI, plastic surgeons, at least someone like me, I, I was hyper-specialized in face and neck. Uh, and in face and neck lifts and all these aesthetic procedures primarily were started by plastic surgeons, not facial plastic surgeons, board certified plastic surgeons. Facial plastic surgeons came on and they've really contributed a lot in the history of these procedures. Where I trained in New York was a mixture of plastic surgeons and facial plastic surgeons, some of the best in the business. Mm -hmm. And they all were innovators and did amazing stuff. So, but I, if you're wanting to have these aesthetic procedures, I, I personally, professionally would highly recommend also a facial plastic surgeon or a plastic surgeon that has focuses, focuses in on head and neck like we do. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's take a quick break. We'll be back to talk about the several other types of physicians and a little bit more. Exciting stuff. Yes. Back. Some more dry talk about doctor training, but this is really important stuff. So please keep listening. And if you do want to skip ahead to the next chapter in the description box, I understand, but there's really good stuff here on these next types of doctors. So let's talk about oceoplastics. Not everything surgeons. in medicine is sexy. You know, sometimes you have to get down to the nuts some, and bolts. Yeah, sometimes you got to get under the hood with your yeah. doctor and see what's going on. You got to so, see what's going on there. Ocuplastics, who are they? These are eye professionals. Who Those are ophthalmologists. Yeah. So think about it in your minds when you go to the ophthalmologist for your eyeball, you know, stuff like that. That's who they are. They are by training ophthalmologist. Eye. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yes, they are oculoplastic surgeons are ophthalmologists, medical doctors with and eye surgeons with additional plastic surgery training who treat the eyes and adjacent areas. This is what's key with all of these things. So they perform both surgical and non-surgical procedures related to the eyes and surrounding areas. So Dr. Martin, is a tummy tuck surrounding your eyes? 
I mean, it's connected mm. by way of, you know. You can see it. Yeah, you can see it from your eyes. So is it things I can see with my eyes? So, yeah. You know, the reason we're talking about each of these different types of doctors, you may think, well, aren't those all the same? Um, no, they're not really. So it really, they all focus on one thing. It doesn't mean they're not doing other things, but these are the things that fundamentally are what they're trained in. So the education for oculoplastic surgeons is medical school, a three-year residency, and two years of advanced fellowship training in ophthalmolic plastic orbit and reconstructive surgery. All right, so that means ophthalmology residency is three years. I should have done that instead of my stupid seven right. years. Yeah. So then... You at least have another year in the plastic surgery realm, but maybe two. I don't remember it being two, but maybe it's two now. So that's five years total. Well, that would be for plastic and reconstructive. Okay, but that's not double boarded. That's just nope. the oculoplastic Correct. portion of it. Yep. So I'm sure if two years of training, that's pretty good uh, doing facelifts and neck lifts and stuff like that to really get comfortable with that stuff. But there's no question in the first, and I, I you know, and again, I'm, Middle aged now, so I'm not in training programs anymore. But I can't imagine ophthalmology residency or doing a lot of these facial plastic surgeries. But I could be wrong. They're going to be focusing on the eyeball and things related to ophthalmology, and and they're amazing, amazing, oh, yeah. amazing surgeons. And some of the best surgeons we know are ocular plastic surgeons or the eyes ophthalmologists. Eyes are so complicated. Very hard, mm -hmm. especially eyelids and the yeah. and the and. The, the you muscles know. of the eye. Oh, and yeah. the, the retina, and the globe of the eye. Yeah. It's it's amazing. So hats off to these surgeons. If you're going to go to an ophthalmologist, then you better know that they've had training in plastic surgery. Mm -hmm. So they to be an oculoplastic, I'm sure you have to have some certification. There is the American Board of Ophthalmology and the American Society of Ophthalmolic Plastic and Reconstructive okay. Surgery. All right. Well, I'm sure there's a way you can look that up. Yes. And so yes. It, <laughs> those boards right. can be searched just like they can for right. in the link. Right. Plastic surgeons. Um, so in. You know, they have to have experience, et cetera, et cetera. I would feel a lot more comfortable going to an oculopathic surgeon than I would a non subspecialist for any facial procedure. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. All right. Let's talk about dermatologists. Yeah. We love dermatologists. We do love dermatologists. Dermatologists are skin savers, perform surgeries and procedures related to the skin, including skin cancer surgery, liposuction, and non surgical treatments for the face and body. So, non surgical treatments. Liposuction, I, I would call that surgical. I, I don't know why people think liposuction is non surgical. We talk a lot about that in our it's episode pretty invasive. about liposuction. Yeah. It's surgery. It's way more invasive mm -hmm. than some of these facial procedures. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah, I, I would definitely say that liposuction is surgical, but technically, dermatologists, they kind of consider them non surgical. I would also consider skin cancer removal surgical. Surgical. Oh, Mohs yeah. procedure. I mean, Mohs is kind of a subspecialty of dermatology. That's, but that's yeah, surgery. It that's what I mean. Absolutely, they do procedural is. stuff yeah. every day. Der uh, liposuction in part was started by a dermatologist, mm -hmm. Dr. Klein. Oh, the dermatologist duo with the Botox. I mean, they're like critical. The yeah. husband wife team. If you listen to our Botox episode, where we talk about the history of Botox. Dermatologists. Oh, that's such critical. a great story. Dermatologists and eye doctors. Uh, what episode was that? It was Botox. Everything you should know about Botox. Nils is going to show that here. Yeah. Oh, that was a great episode. Yeah. So what do dermatologists do? You may want to see a dermatologist for any skin concerns, treatments like lasers, injectables, and skin rejuvenation, prescription skin medication, as well as annual skin checks. Yeah. Education for a dermatologist, medical school. Okay. Yeah. Four years. Followed by one year of a medical surgical internship. Right. That's a transition year. Yeah. And a required three-year residency, oh, residency specializing like in four years. disease and surgery. Yeah. But you have to do a residency specializing in, in skin disease and surgery. Do you really want to do all that skin disease stuff? I don't know. Four years sounds really much better right. than seven or eight years. Optional you know? postgraduate fellowship in a subspecialty of dermatology includes Mohs. Yeah. Surgery as well. Maybe completed and ongoing education, of course, yeah. is what okay. is needed. So yeah, they, der dermatologists uh, are an amazing part of, you know, skin health. And, oh, and we rely on our dermatologists. So much. So much. Yeah. So yeah. like we're very pro dermatologists. Mm -hmm. They tend to. Swing bigger than they can over. They, they think they can hit it over the fences sometimes, but that's okay. At but, least they have this fundamental knowledge. I yeah, mean, they have yeah. they have a baseline training yes. that's amazing. Their skill set, their knowledge base is super helpful, yeah. uh, especially for offices like ours. They tend to be very good at aesthetics in terms of things that are less invasive. Think lasers, injectables, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Their business model is geared toward that. Their training is geared toward that. So. 
Um, yeah, skin you know, health. Very pro yeah. dermatology. Absolutely. They do have a board as well. They have the American Board of Dermatology, American Dermatology Association, American Osteopathic Board of Dermatology, American Academy of Dermatology, American Society for Dermatology, Jeez. Dermatologic Surgery, and American Osteopathic College of Dermatology. Wow. So <laughs> there are a lot of places where you can go to find out if your dermatologist is board certified. That's like Lots. too many places. Yeah, we, it is a lot. We need like Kayak or one of those travel sites. Yeah, that, for dermatologists. Yeah. It does an amalgam of everything. Right. Yeah. Like my goodness, yeah, we love our, we refer to some great dermatologists and yeah, I mean, sometimes skin is weird, right? Like skin does weird things. Yeah. We had a, one of our trauma patients called and asked if we could, you know, tell her what to do for like some bumps she had on her face, like after a fall, I'm like, we're talking like a skin eruption, not like anything actually related to this fall. I'm like, no, you need to see a dermatologist for that. <laughs> like, that's not us. So, all right, let's talk about hair restoration. I found this one really fascinating. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know much about hair restoration. Yeah, I didn't either. I mean, it seems like it's always seems like one of those things like that people just kind of start doing. So I was really wondering, same thing with the cosmetic dentistry, like really was fascinated to read about some of the specifics about how you can really check on the qualifications of that provider. So who are hair rest restoration specialists? These hair helpers perform hair loss <laughs> treatments and hair transplantation <laughs> surgery, transplant <laughs> surgeries, procedures. Oh, my gosh. Are you words. a hair, hair helper? Are you a hair helper? Many doctors can perform hair procedures, but to achieve optimal are you a results, breast helper? Do we you, are. Do you help breasts? We do. Yeah. It's best to see a hair restoration specialist who has extensive knowledge and experience. So, how do you know if they have it? Medical school and proper medical training to become a specialized to become specialized in hair restoration, as well as ongoing continuing education during their career. So, so really, that, any doctor, can right? Any doctor can do it, but it's usually like yeah. a dermatologist, right, or something like that, or yeah, these, facial plastics, or even plastic surgeons do. I, I, I have. Um, contemporaries who do a lot of hair restoration. Yeah, I think a lot of them are derms. For the board specialties with this one, it said doctors must be certified by one of the following. The American okay. Board of Plastic Surgery, yep. American Board of Dermatology, yep. American Board of Otolaryngology, Facial Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. Mm. Societies include International Society of, Restor of Hair Restoration Surgery. So I actually think this is definitely one of those things that perhaps there has been historically more research on things like hair restoration in foreign countries. So finding a doctor who is part of this International Society of Hair Restoration Surgery might be a good place too if you're yeah. really confused about who to go to if you live in an area where there's just so many providers. Like, yeah. I have a good caveat to this. So Amy, what's the sports show I listen to all the time? Kentucky Sports Radio? Oh, I know where you're going. With this. There is a, a character on there. I mean, he's a real person, <laughs> yes. but his name is uh, oh, Ryan, uh, not Ryan. Yeah. I think it's Ryan. Anyways, one of the one of the main characters on this sports show, and it's it's more than a sports show. But anyways, <laughs> he got a hair transplantation, and they were talking about it for months, right? They're talking about this hair. Yes. Then, well, that was when we were still driving back and forth to Aspen. Yeah. So yes, I heard these episodes. And uh, he, it was so funny. Like he's like giving a shout out to the plastic surgeon who I know, who I who basically trained at the same place I do. I text back and forth with him a lot of times when we were trading patients. Yeah, and he had integrated hair transplantation into his office and he did this the guy on the radio show i'm sure for a promotion but it was hilarious maybe maybe not that was it was great yeah. to listen to yeah yeah dr degenis in louisville kentucky there excellent you, surgeon there's a great referral to a, plas yeah. a plastic surgeon that does hair restoration he does an amazing uh, listen ryan from kentucky sports radio he had no hair and now he has an amazing hair in the front and in the middle. He has like, amazing it's pretty amazing. <laughs> it's actually seeing him before and afterwards, I was like, that's pretty remarkable. Yeah. He looks like a different person. And it looks natural too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think they're really the doctors who do this, it pretty it is really remarkable what they can do. Like very remarkable. All right. Let's talk about cosmetic dentists. We know more about this because these are smile yeah. fixers. Yeah, they're great. They love cosmetic dentists. Perform procedures related to the smile, including full mouth reconstruction. Mm -hmm. If you're looking to change your smile or have an aesthetic procedure done, you should choose a cosmetic dentist as they focus on improving the smile from an aesthetic point of view. Right. And, and this is a lot. Too. This is a lot more confusing mm -hmm. now. Like I, I do Invisalign with my dentist, who's technically not a cosmetic dentist. And so you can get into this kind of gray area with dentistry, um, but these cosmetic dentists are hyper trained and their sole practice is cosmetic dentistry. Mm -hmm. So kind of like my sole practice is plastic surgery, a cosmetic plastic surgery. Yeah. Uh, for education, they go to dental school along with specialized training programs to further their education. They also undergo specialized training in cosmetic procedures. So that is an interesting point because the dentist we go to, he focuses a, a lot on the functional component it's more of the functional. aesthetic. Yeah. He can do some aesthetic stuff, but at him, it's more functional. Right. It's how's how you your function back. How's your occlusion? Mm -hmm. How does it fit together? Are you having TMJ? How's your He's, bone? Fun? Right. Like, and it's totally appropriate for a dentist to do that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, and he'll do aesthetic stuff. 
but it, it's not that's not his sole focus. His sole focus is primary dentistry. Yeah, and the doctors or general who, dentist, dentistry. Gen, yep, general dentistry. But the doctors who focus on aesthetics, like they're going to focus more on the way your smile looks, and that's what I think that was really key that new beauty brought out these are smile fixers they're maybe doing full mouth reconstruction I like to call them smile helpers smile helpers yeah yep like the hair helpers like a hair helper they're smile fixers yeah. but you know a lot of people are, are maybe their teeth look fine but when they smile they have like their gums are very prominent or their you know their alignment is a little bit off like those are things that a cosmetic too much dentist incisor can, show yeah, yeah can really help with shorten lip yeah, they do all those things. And even, I mean, there's laser treatments that can be done by, like dentists have cool dental lasers for gum treatments and other types of things that can, like lightning treatments that are very, very cool. Boards of specialties for these doctors are cosmetic dentists or members of the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry, the American Board of Oral and Maxofacial Surgery, the American Board of Periodontal, and the American Board of Prostodontics. I can't even believe the amount of words I'm having to say today. <laughs> And I chose this episode. Other notable societies include the American Association right. of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons. I would have Surgeons, given up already. I would the, not have kept talking. The American College of Just Prostodontists of and the American Comprehensive Aesthetics, the American Society for Dental Aesthetics, and the American Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry. Mm. So many words. So, yeah. Yes. There, so they're like dermatology. There are a lot of places to go. And I think this just shows that the field is definitely newer and emerging. You know, So I think there is more there are more people in it and more little subspecialties within these things. So that's why there's probably a lot more places to look for them. So. Yeah. But and they, better get out the checkbook when you go to these yeah, guys these are and ladies. Cheap. Whew, yeah. God. It is pricey. Yeah, I chose the wrong field to go into. Maybe, but maybe yeah. not. I don't know. Who wins in the end? I don't know. We'll see. It's hard to say. Yeah. I might win the race. We'll yeah. see what happens. So my almost my favorite part of this article was the very back page of it, mm. which were questions to ask. And I'm like, I thought oh. the whole article was about the societies that you have. to No. Look up. And again, like I, these are such important things. And we we talk about this in our episode where we talk about preparing for your pre-op appointment, like or how to choose a surgeon. Like these are important questions to ask. And I love these. And I think I really like that they put them in terms that perhaps you and I would not. They're very patient focused questions. Right. Like they're phrased in a way that a person will understand what they're trying to get to. So number one. How many procedures like mine have you performed? Reasonable. Yep, good question. This will tell you how much the experience your doctor has with the chosen procedure and whether it is a new treatment technique or surgery. Uh, it, that is never, surpri it always surprises me when someone comes in and they're like, well, this doctor like had this new thing and they wanted to try it on me. Like, fantastic. Like, and now I mean, here. we've done that. We've done that here. But it's a technology. It's not like a whole new surgery right. you're doing. Right. That was, I was about yeah. to say, it's not like I've never done liposuction no. before. So like we did liposuction with RF energy, right. body Or I'm going to use this new cannula. Or yeah. hey, I got a new pickup. <laughs> but it's always a derivative or mm -hmm. a cousin of things I'm already doing. You know, and, and even like newer techniques and like facelifts or something like that, deep plane versus regular, you know, smastectomy, it's all related. Mm -hmm. And if you're already doing one, you can do the other. But like just going to someone, they're like, well, I'm just... Trying this out. Right. Just started doing lipo yesterday. Uh, not sure. Yes. You go next. Can you show me your before and after photos, please? Well, this one's great. And I always encourage people, like they'll ask like why we don't have a lot of before and after pictures on our website. And I'll tell them, you know, there's a lot of reasons. We really respect our patients' privacy, but also not every before and after picture is actually helpful to people in the way they think it might be. I, breast augmentation is my favorite one. I actually have a. a whole, we do have a lot of photos, oh, we but we tons. just don't put them all on our website. Yeah. That's really the difference. Because we want to be able to share them with share pictures of people and that work are meaningful it. to them. Yeah, and work through it. Yes. Like actually, with them there and sh looking right. at the photos and answering questions. Like these are women in yeah. their early forties who had a facelift, not a woman who's seventy who had a neck right. lift. You know, like those things. Don't, I, I want to see pictures of people like me, right? Exactly. And I, so I would say, like. This is why a question to ask when you're there. I loved this. Like, can you show me before and after pictures? Let's talk about these pictures. Show me people like me. A lot of our patients may be. There's not a lot of people like you, Amy. No, that's why. Yeah. yeah like I, I'm like a Snuffleupagus. Yeah. I'm the only, or Tigger. Tigger's the only one. Tigger's a terrible thing to be, but Tigger's are only like me or something. But yeah. yeah, you know, this is meaningful to talk to your surgeon while you look at pictures or someone from their staff who can say like, this woman is also an Amazon woman like you. She is 5'11". Or this person she is actually 5'1". She has red hair. Yeah. yeah. She wears flowers in her hair, yes, just you know, like you, and pulls her hair back tight. Yeah. Or people, or they'll look at a picture of someone who had maybe a, a minor procedure done and they need a major one. They're like, well, I want to look like her. I'm like, yeah, so does everybody. But like, let's look at someone who you have a realistic ability to potentially have an outcome similar to. So very important. All right. Uh, next question is, how can I ensure better results or a quicker recovery? Listen to Beauty and the Surgeon podcast yeah. episodes Listen about recovery. Podcast. 
Yes. Uh, didn't we have one like uh, just the supplement around surgery mm-hmm. episode, which Nils is going to put right here. We also have a great episode that, about recovery. I know, but that supplement one yes. I was so intrigued by. So good. Yeah. Like there are things you yeah. can do. And what are those things? I think the same thing would be like, what could I do to make my recovery worse is maybe you should ask some like that's a question to ask, too. Yeah. How about you, Dr. Martin? Uh, what are the risks associated with this procedure? Great uh, question. Like. The main reason we started this podcast was not for self-promotion, was to educate people mm-hmm. on the procedures themselves. That was our idea, and it still is our motivation. It's our ethos. So having people informed and, and empowered and educated is like the best patient ever. It's super exhilarating when someone comes in and like, yeah, I've already listened to your podcast and know everything. Just oh, shut, those are my favorite patients. Shut up, Dr. Martin. <laughs> yes. Get out of my way and just do my surgery and just, just go, go over there and do my surgery. Don't say words. But it's because they know. Yeah, they know it. Yes. They're they're like there. They know what they're getting into. They listen it, for 20 hours. Yes. <laughs> yeah, they, they, we they are Mills like level educated. <laughs> yeah, they, yes. they literally know. Yes. So, you no know, procedures without risk. No. And if your doctor tells you there are no risks, right. ooh, find a new doctor. All right. And I have to yeah. tell you, I think, uh, you know, the more you get wisdom and you do this stuff a lot, like, you know, aesthetics, basic aesthetic surgery of some sort, you realize that what people really judge you by is honesty and transparency. Mm-hmm. And that's what they want. Like if you're good, that you, it, I tell the fellows all the time, it rises to the top. If you're good at what you do, hair transplantation, facial plastic surgery, oculoplastics, dermatology, um, plastic surgery, you're gonna rise to the top. But what people really want is transparency and honesty honesty yeah. and realistic expectations and talking about the risks is associated with that. We talk about the risk. We have a whole episode. With every yeah. patient that comes in, even when they don't want to talk about yeah. the risk. And they'll say things like this, oh, this don't makes me nervous. Me. Yeah. I don't want to think about that. And I'm like, well, we're going to talk about that. Yeah. And we're going to actually work through it. So yeah, informed, listen to our episode about an- unanticipated outcomes. Yeah. Informed mm-hmm. consent yeah. is integral to an ethical practice of any sort, especially surgery. So. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to lump the next three together, which is what is the procedure like? What is the recovery like? And how long will it take before I start? Actually, let's just do those two together. Procedure like, recovery like, those are important things to know, especially for things you might be awake for. Let's say you're going to a dermatologist. I feel like we have a, like a couple recovery episodes. We do. Yep. We have, I mean, in each of our procedure episodes, we talk about recovery, but we do yeah. have a whole episode just about recovery. But what is the procedure like? You know, if, if you're having cosmetic dentistry done like will you be awake for it will you need to ride home what is the recovery like when can i eat again you know or when can i fill in the blank we'll talk about your recovery and specifics in a few but you know just kind of knowing and to your level we have patients who don't want to know the specifics of what's being done during surgery but they want to know you know what to expect when they get to the hospital maybe yeah we're an ostrich free office we don't let people put their head in the sand no but we also don't yank it out do ostriches really do that or no yeah okay yeah, we also don't force people to know details of things they don't want to know. I mean, like, yeah. I, not everyone needs to know like how we dissect a facelift flap, but you know they need to know like they'll be put to sleep, and then Dr. Martin will come in and do the surgery. And Most people don't, but every now and then you get that patient that comes in because we do tons of facelifts, thing? and they're like, "Tell me exactly what you're doing. Yeah. Or Show me tags. a picture." Yes, and you're like, "Are you sure? Are you sure?" Yeah, and sometimes you start, and they're like, "No, no, I changed my mind. All right, never mind. Yeah. That looks gross." Yep. So you know, to your comfort level, ask what the procedure will be like, what the recovery will be like. Doctor Martin, let's give you this one. How long will it take before I start to see results? Ooh. There are some surgeries. That's the second reason we started this yes. this podcast is expectations and what people should conceivably think for any surgery. Um, like, will my laser hair removal take a year? Right. How yeah. long will it take? You know, like for hair transplantation, I'm not an expert in it, but there's a period where it looks like you have hair and then it goes away and then it kind of grows after that. So, you know, if you went to a hair transplant specialist and they didn't explain to you at length that you're going to lose some of the hair we transplant in or uh, visibly, it seems like you're losing the hair, then that would really freak you out and you would feel very distressed. So mm-hmm. scoping in that recovery, when those results will be, and especially for facial stuff, uh, which is or body stuff like lipo yeah like six months six yeah, to for eight sure. months tummy tuck maybe a year you know before you really see your mm-hmm. final results yeah like it won't not that it won't be improved but like till you start seeing results versus final results also very different things right like, when can i go back to work the gym when can i resume wearing makeup using skincare products you know, these are course, all amy questions yeah these are all going to vary on what you had done but really important i mean if you're having an invasive laser treatment 
even for us, like after a facelift, like I don't want people going back on their retinol right away. These are all really good questions to ask. The workout question or work, you know, that's what I say to somebody. Well, what do you, what, what does workout look like to you? Because workout to me is very different. Okay. So if somebody's like, oh, I just like to go walk on the treadmill for 30 minutes. I'm like, well, you could do that yesterday. Yeah. You know, if I want to get back to deadlifting 225 for sets of 10, like, okay, maybe in you three weeks, you know, like <laughs> 12 weeks, six months. No, I'm just saying there's a, even our patients. I'm, I'm not joking. I got up to like 280 the other day. That was like, okay, what am dang, I doing? That's crazy. Well, it's, please. Or even something like I mean, I, I feel like there was a guy next to me carrying a bar with 280 pounds on it oh, with one hand. It's like, I'm, excuse me, sir. Yeah, I'm gonna go deadlift over here. It's the guy who does squats with like fit 515. Uh, like, like he has thunder form. thighs. Yeah, his thigh. I mean, no, his thighs thigh. look normal. Mm, like not, I mean, normal for a lifting person. Not the one I saw. Oh, this guy okay. is like a beast. There's a guy at my gym who is so freakishly strong. It makes me. I mean, I never, but yeah. yeah, way down the rabbit hole. So good questions to ask. You know, the things I would say, make a list of the things that like you kind of do on a daily basis, like even if it's just in your head and be like, okay, well, so when can I do the fill in the blank? Can I go back to my skincare regime right away? Can I go back to the gym? I'm not going to bring up the S word that you hate because then you'll bring up the V word that I hate and we're not going to go there. So just the things that are important in your life, make sure you ask. <laughs> we have to okay. behave ourselves. This, this is new the beauty. Final, final one goes beauty. to you, Dr. Martin. How long do the results last and what do I need to maintain them? So, um, man, this is like a common question, especially in the facial stuff. I mean, again, I do everything. Sorry, facial plastic surgeons, but right, we uh, do everything top to we're, bottom. We're we're <laughs> focusing in on the face because this is kind of the street battle area of all these subspecialties. But um, you know, results last. It's indeterminate. Depends for, on what you're having done. Yeah, depends on you, on your genetics, on mm -hmm. your anatomy, on your lifestyle. If you get a face and neck lift and you don't take care of yourself, you expose your face to the sun all the time. You smoke cigarettes. You have live an unhealthy lifestyle. It's 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 not going to last a long time. You could do everything right, okay, and not smoke and live a healthy life and wear sunscreen, and your face can look like crap in five years because that's just your genetics and that's the way you're pre-programmed and with aging. So. Yeah. Everyone's different. I think it's really important. I've been saying this a lot to patients lately about finding someone that you can trust and can guide you almost like an ombudsman through aging and then sticking with that person. Yeah. Sticking with that person, Sherpa. seeing them on, on a regular basis, you know, uh, making sure that you trust them and they're not just trying to sell you things. And they're always you're trying to stay ahead of the curve a little bit. You're trying to manage uh, with smaller things and bigger things. I think that's the best way to go. It's like a, a aesthetic facial pro forma. I should write that article. For yeah, new for new beauty. beauty. Yeah, and truthfully, I mean, with some of these things, previous performance, meaning how you've aged up until this point, will will play a role. Other things like teeth whitening, right? Your habits are probably going to contribute to that over time. Maybe you can maintain them by doing a few things better. Um, I would never give up coffee. Right, and so there you go. So your results are. I, mean, gonna I last don't care long. if my. Would you drink it through a straw? Would you drink it in a hut? Would you drink it with a pop? I don't know. <laughs> but I don't care if my teeth are neon yellow. Like, right. I mean, that, but that's just it. Like, what could you do to make it better? I mean, How long is it going to no last? Yeah. So, Dr. Elson. I don't Elson care what the aesthetic uh, detriment it is to It's going to tell you that you're going to need to whiten your teeth every six months. All right, yeah. fine. You know, I mean, like, I'm sure to the acceptable cosmetic surgeon, like drinking coffee is like smoking to me for the face. You know, it's the same idea. Yeah. But, like, you know, that's, you this? it's important to know. And, like, Knowing the results or like laser, I think are my favorite thing. People are like, oh, well, should I get a deep laser when I get my face lift? I'm like, well, you can, but you're also going to need another one in a year. So get one with your dermatologist whenever. You know, there are things that are just kind of maintenance that are life maintenance and other things like a tummy tuck that you do once and maybe last you for the rest of your life. Yep. Yeah. You just don't know. One thing I do know for sure, safety first. Yep. This was also something I was so happy that they put in there. They have this little checklist that said, safety first, use this checklist to confirm that your doctor has met the following criteria. If you listen to nothing else in this episode, please listen to this. I'm listening, Amy. That your doctor meets- I wasn't listening before, but I'm listening now. All education and training requirements for his or her specialty. Yeah, so they're board certified. They are board certified and recognized by the American Board of Medical Specialties. Remember, this is a specific group, unless they are cosmetic dentists who do not receive board certification. Most important of all, practice within scope. Performs on performs procedures he or she has been trained on. Right? Performs with it, practice within scope. Dr. Martin is general surgery trained. If we just started telling people we're gonna start taking out their gallbladder and we do their tummy tuck, would that really be appropriate? Not really. And you're trained in that. I feel like I could do it though. You could do it, but should you do it? No. You know, and you're actually you are trained. So to have a doctor who's not trained who then just starts doing these right. things. Yeah, we made that joke. It's like it doesn't seem to work in reverse for no. plastic surgery. Everyone wants to do plastic surgery, and they tell everybody they're a plastic surgeon, but 
no plastic surgeon is trying to act like a dermatologist or this or that. You know what I'm saying? Rarely. Correct. And that's and where the it's, next. It's money driven. Yes. The bigger ticket items are the surgeries that I do. Right. And yeah. this is why you want to make sure your doctor is known to be reputable and ethical. If you are going to a doctor who is calling themselves a plastic surgeon and you find out they are not. Yeah. Is that really ethical? No. It's like Dr. Martin doing a gallbladder removal. Is that really ethical in, in a non-emergent like situation? a little bit. <laughs> I mean, if I need my gallbladder out, I'll let you take a swing at it. Okay, how about I mean, that? Yeah, yeah well, you can practice. You get the first, you get the first. I don't need to practice. I did like 100 in training. Yeah. So. But, you know. But it was like 20, it's like 20 years, years ago. Yeah. You know, I think those are things to think about. And, you know, it, everyone looks they're like, oh, well, it says plastic surgeon right there on the door. Well, it must be right. Oh, trust but verify, people. Trust but verify. And if you find out this doctor is calling themselves a plastic surgeon and they're not, well, that to me is not reputable and it's not ethical. So that's that's me. And uh, the final one here on the checklist is performing procedures in a facility that conforms to strict yeah. safety standards. People ask us, why do you guys do surgery in a hospital? Why don't yeah. you do surgery at a surgery center? Why are you doing your office? Yeah. Uh, like, no. No. Like, this is your life. And we talk about this a lot in our podcast. Like, surgery is very safe because we do it in a safe way. Yeah. And we, we're we not immune to people having this issue or that yeah, issue. Yeah, complications and will the, happen. And the reason that our patients turn out well is because we take their safety as our number one priority. Mm -hmm. We do it in quad A certified hospital-based mm -hmm. operating rooms, which is not always the norm. Uh, that are, and at least in our current situation is a level two trauma center uh, staffed fully by intensivists in a, in a large ICU. They're very reputable. God forbid something happened that was weird, you, you would are live. The best possible place live. to have that happen. Yes. Right. I mean, that's the key. Yep. And uh, again, we've never had to utilize that extreme measure, but you know, why? Why not plan for the worst? Yeah, and we've needed it on small scale. I mean, there have yeah. absolutely been times when it's been helpful to have a hospitalist there for someone who maybe is having blood blood pressure issues after mm -hmm. surgery, They're you know, bleeding or, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, you know, those people are there. So, way to go, New Beauty. I am a huge fan, and I am so happy that I am not the only person shouting out this information. I feel very deficient that I don't even know New Beauty existed. I'm in this business. It's probably the the number one publication, and they're probably, if they ever watch this, they're probably yeah. like that guy is what in God's name is wrong with that. No, it's super surgery. fun to go through. And this this episode, I mean, by the time this comes out, it'll, they'll, their summer one will be out. But if you, you can always go back and look at the Beauty Awards for 2023, I mean, there's great products, you know, of all price points. Like they, it's not just like super expensive things. I mean, they literally talk about the best body wash. Oh, Native, we use that. Yeah, love Native. Love you know, Native. They have an Epion's, um face wash in here as one of their yeah. top products this year, which we love. Epion. I mean, yep. great products. They definitely do a lot of research. Yeah, companies may be paying to get in at, just as the doctors are in the back, but that doesn't mean that they're not Aesth actually doing what they say. Aesthetics is a multi, multi billion yeah. dollar Everybody business. wants to get paid. There's a lot of money in it. Yes. Yeah. So you're, it's unavoidable. Yeah. But I really appreciate everybody. I hope you listened. And I, if you are, if you have someone who's considering doing any type of procedure, have them listen to this episode so they can at least be educated about who is doing this procedure on them. I mean, the, the times when a bad thing hap happens, that are preventable because someone just didn't do any research on who they were going to, those should not, those don't need to happen. Right. Because bad, bad things, things are going to happen. Bad things can happen. Yes. That's the key. Everyone's going to have bad things happen at some right. point. So it's important that you're at a place that can wrap around that mm -hmm. for you. In and a way knows what to do. And knows what to do. Yeah. So 150. I feel like that deserves a oh my gosh. shoulder punch. Yeah, 150. Thank you everyone so much for listening. If you have questions, comments, please leave us a rating review. We really appreciate it. You can find us anywhere you listen to podcasts. By 300, you're going to be like gray haired and hunched over. Yeah, that's not that far from now. So yeah. But by then, I know a good plastic surgeon is going to take care of that. I'm going to be super pulled tight. My, that's a my, weird look. I, I won't be able to close my eyes. Yep, that's what I'm hoping for. Yeah. Remember this face. It's going to last yeah. forever. So thank you all so much for listening. Please do leave us a like, a comment, share us, review us. It really does help. And we really appreciate everybody being here. And knowledge is powerful. Remember that. Knowledge is powerful. And safety first. Safety first. See ya.